Uh, Congresswoman Jackie Speer represents California's 14th Congressional District, which includes Millbrae. We know her to be a tireless advocate for women's rights, the public good, and the security of Americans. She was named to Newsweek's list of 150 fearless women in the world. She serves on the House Armed Services Committee as the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Military Personnel, on the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, and the House Committee on Oversight and Reform. Jackie has held over a dozen town halls entitled A Conversation About America throughout her district, and we are honored and thrilled that she's hosting one here in Millbrae. It is especially fitting to have Jackie in Millbrae as we celebrate the month of March as Women's History Month and recently, International Women's Day on March 8th. Ladies and gentlemen, our favorite Congresswoman, Jackie Spear. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm so glad that you came out on this um, great Saturday morning um, to join me. Uh, I must apologize again to the uh, constituents in the overflow room. We were originally under the impression that this um, was consistent with 270 participants in this room. Actually, it's limited to 170, and that's why some of our friends are in the other room. But we're going to make sure that their questions get answered as well. I want to say a special thank you to MCTV, who, which is um, actually hosting this and also filming it, and to Marge Colopietro, who must have had 10, 15, 20 conversations um, with Katrina Real, my deputy director, in planning this. Thank you so very much, Marge. And also thank you to Dana at um, MCTV for her work. And we will um, begin. All right, I want to just tell you what's happened since the beginning of the year. <laughs> HR1 is the uh, For the People Act. This particular measure um, is an effort to clean up what's going on in Washington. So among the many things is that it um, is going to require all candidates for president uh, and vice president to uh, provide their income tax for the last 10 years. <laughs> uh, as you can see, it makes Election Day a national holiday. Why has it taken us so long to do that? Um, it also has a lot of... Um, elements that deal with uh, activities that we have seen go on, go on uh, in the, this administration around misuse of travel by cabinet level persons. Uh, it also has a provision around um, doing away with a partisan gerrymandering, as you can see, um, tightening the rules around super PACs. You can kind of go down the list and, and see all this. One of the um, elements of HR1 that didn't get in was my bill, which I'm very upset about, but I introduced it anyway. It's HR 1028, no, excuse me, HR 1032, and it's called the Right Act, and it's all about nepotism. Funny thing about that, right? Uh, the anti-nepotism law was created after Bobby Kennedy had been Attorney General. It's worked perfectly well um, since then, except when this president got into office, he got around it by making his two, his daughter and son-in-law, volunteers. And because they're volunteers, um, they're not subject to the anti-nepotism law. Uh, my bill makes anyone associated with the family of a president or vice president not able to work in the administration under any capacity and hopefully we'll be able to um, take that measure up because as you can see, it ha it's fraught with conflicts. And the fact that uh, Mr. Kushner couldn't get a uh, security clearance going through the normal order and then the president just said, no, give it to him, shows you that uh, it's a system that allows for people not playing by the rules and that's what's happened. And you may say, well, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that uh, we don't know what he is negotiating with Saudi Arabia because he's got his personal business interests involved as well. So H.R. 4 is the Voting Rights Advancement Act. Um, this is a very serious um, 
bill, and it's trying to right a wrong that the Supreme Court uh, engaged in back in 2013, where it, it changed the status of certain states that had been historically uh, not complying with voting rights by limiting access to voting um, booths. Uh, this would reverse that, and uh, the long lines you saw, the IDs required, the long periods of time before you could uh, register to vote, all of those were, came into operation after 2013, and this um, would change all of that. So um, we'll go on to the next one. H.R. 5 is the Equality Act. It basically says that the LGBTQ community uh, under Title II of the Civil Rights Act um, cannot be discriminated against on any level, whether it's employment, housing, uh, and the like. Um, and H.R. 6 is the DREAM Act, which was just introduced. Uh, that's for all the DACA uh, young people living in our country. Uh, the President at one point said he was supportive of the legislation, and then, of course, um, uh, recanted. And the reason now that DACA kids can still stay here um, and work and go to school is because it's in the courts. We don't anticipate that this court will take this up until probably uh, 2020. That's when a decision will come down. So getting H.R. 6 passed will be important. This basically says you had to come here before you were 16, uh, that you've lived here, gone to school here, uh, that you haven't committed any crimes, that uh, you have finished high school. You can continue to be in the country and work on a provisional uh, level with that much. If you want to get permanent status as a legal resident, you have to have two years of college um, a, or a technical school certificate or join the military for two years. H.R. 8 is the Bipartisan Background Check Act. Uh, this is the bill that basically closes all the loopholes in terms of gun ownership. So if there's any transfer of a gun, whether it's at a gun show online, uh, between family members, uh, you will have to go through a background check. This one um, just passed both houses by uh, almost unanimous out of, it was unanimous out of the House, basically uh, <laughs> indicating that we want the Mueller report to become public. And it was interesting to see all the Republicans voted for it as well. And I, I put this up because I want you to realize that as much as we have dealt with these uh, tragic fires that have ripped through the state, this issue is a bigger issue than the fires. And I have been working with uh, Supervisor Pine and many of the city council members throughout the region because we are ground zero for sea level rise. And I don't care if you live in the hills of Millbrae, if you want to flush your toilets, um, you should be concerned about this because all the sewage treatment plants are located at the bay. Uh, so we have to come up with a, uh, and I'm not sure exactly what it's going to look like, but we have to create a district um, so that we can prepare for sea level rise. Um, by creating a district, we'll also be eligible for federal funds, which frankly we aren't eligible for. And uh, I want to make sure we get our fair share of our tax dollars returned to us. So um, I, I bring that up just for that purpose. And I think that is it. Okay. <laughs> All right. This, the floor is yours. Start asking your questions. We'll start on, on this side. I'll take a couple from here, and then we'll move over here and back and forth. Okay. Anyone with a question in this? Yes. The, the, the biggest lie in the media is uh, liberal media. There's no liberal media. There's a conservative media, there's very conservative media, and there's Fox News. Um, how can the average person deal with, uh, with, with this kind of overwhelming propaganda in the media that, that favors uh, the right wing? So the question of who can you believe, right? Isn't that sort of <laughs> what you're um, asking? It, it really takes time now. You can't just look at what you see on TV um, and sometimes what you even read in the paper, it requires you to go online and go to many of the sites that exist that 
um, will sift through the fiction and the facts. Washington Post, Post does a Pinocchio test uh, where they show you know, up to four Pinocchios. Unfortunately, our president has a lot of Pinocchios. Um, <laughs> but um, it, you know, it, it really requires us to be more engaged, which is you know, regrettable. I mean, Walter Cronkite is not who we have on, on TV anymore that we can somehow have the confidence. And I will say that for, for all of the, st the, the cable stations, frankly. I mean, there's no question that MSNBC is more liberal, um, and Fox is extremely conservative. I mean, the fact that the President of the United States has a nightly um, nightcap with um, Sean Hannity is, says something about what has happened to media in this country. Um, so I think that uh, the more you watch local news, and they were here earlier today, <laughs> that's good. Um, and then as you look at information online, don't just take it for fact. Go and go to Snopes or all the others that exist that, um, that test it. Any other questions on this side? Okay, over there. Hi, thank you, Jackie. Uh, you're in the uh, you're in the military. I'm now chairing the military personnel subcommittee in armed services. Okay, so we've abandoned most of our treaties on nuclear armed protection. Uh, other countries are building hundreds of submarines, nuclear arms, and things like that. What are we doing to build treaties and to stop this? So, regrettably, um, the president has pulled out of um, the INF, which is um, the treaty that we had uh, with a number of European countries and with Russia. Now, there's no question the INF, that Russia was violating INF. Um, but by pulling out of it, it's like open season. And it's going to I encourage more uh, low-level nuclear weapons, um, and uh, the buildup is going to start. So. Uh, we need the president to recognize that he has an obligation for our national security to uh, renegotiate a treaty with Russia um, that we can all live with. Uh, because a buildup of arms is going to do us no good. Having you know, 3,000 nuclear um, missiles to, to kind of blow each other up when you only need one or two is kind of um, ridiculous, not to mention very expensive. Now, we have a, 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 an arsenal that is old that probably needs to be um, modified and rehabilitated, uh, but that doesn't mean building more. That means rehabilitating the ones we have. Congressman, we also have questions from the other room. Yes, okay, let's take a couple from the other room. Okay, I'm going to give you two. The first one says, why aren't you running for president in 2020? <laughs> and then the second one. The good news is there are a lot of candidates to choose from. The second one says, what are you doing to address the following three issues? Gun violence, hate crimes, and corruption of the Trump administration as appointees. Gun violence, hate crimes, and corruption. So I think you know, um, based on my long legislative history, that um, I am a fervent uh, supporter of gun violence prevention measures. I proudly have an, a, pen, a pin that I wear from time to time that is just the simple F. And if you ever see me wearing that pin, um, that's because I have an F rating with the NRA. Um, <laughs> so um, I think we need to reinstate the assault weapon ban that Senator Feinstein was responsible for uh, creating. I actually, as you may remember, uh, was the, how, the assembly author of the assault weapon ban in California. It's one of my favorite stories, which I'll tell very briefly because I don't want to waste too much time. But um, I was carrying it on the assembly floor, and one of my colleagues on the Republican side threw up his mic, and he said, well, will the gentlelady yield? And I said, of course I'll yield. I have a question for you. He says, what's your question? He says, have you ever shot an assault weapon, Ms. Spear? Oh my God. And then he said it again. Have you ever shot an assault weapon? And I stood there thinking, if you're stupid enough to ask me this question, I'm going to give it right back. And I said, no, I haven't, but let me ask you a question. Have you ever been shot by an assault weapon? Right. <laughs> but, 
But to show you how times have changed, that bill then flew off the assembly floor and was signed into law by Republican Pete Wilson. That's how times have changed. Uh, next question. No, you have, let's take two from the other room. Okay, from the other room, this happens to be an individual whose health insurance is unaffordable, and she was recently, actually had been diagnosed previously with cancer. Um, what she would like to see is um, a lowering of the Medicare eligibility age to 55 and wants to know if you think that's possible. Yes, it's possible. Yes, I support it. I'm a co-author of the legislation. And frankly, it should be even lower for persons who have uh, serious health conditions like cancer. Um, we have to move to a Medicare for all. We're going to have to do it in stages, but we have to start with those who need it most desperately. Okay, yes, in this room now. Here comes the mic. Thank you. Oh, um, red for Republican, blue for Democrat, and uh, green for St. Patrick, okay? <laughs> you got it covered. Yeah. Uh, I wish uh, we could get the same type of thing in Washington. Uh, I'm really, really uh, concerned about the guns, all right? Uh, when will that uh, bill pass that, uh, that you're mentioning about universal background checks? Is that, is that going to pass? So that bill has passed the House. Um, it passed with a bipartisan vote. There were probably five or six Republicans that voted for it. It's now on the Senate side. The question is, is Mitch McConnell going to let it be taken up? Is one of the senators going to put a hold on the legislation? It is incumbent on all of us to make our case to our friends and family who live in other places in the country because both Senators Feinstein and Harris obviously support it. It's trying to get um, the members of the Senate in more red places to support it. This is common sense. This is not, this is not tough. We have a law that says you've got to have a background check before you buy a gun. It's a 24-hour um, instant background check in some cases, uh, no more than three days. But there's these huge loopholes where you can buy guns on the internet or you can buy them at gun shows or transfer them in, by private parties and not be subject to it. That makes no sense. I would like to know how it is possible for President Trump to arbitrarily uh, cancel treaties and uh, trade agreements and without any objection, because these were passed, and I don't understand how he can do it unilaterally. So he, he can do it, but typically you would have the Senate, because the Senate ratifies treaties, um, the Senate to object and take action, but because the Senate is so paralyzed for fear that um, if they cross the president, somehow they will um, have a Trump candidate running against them in a Republican primary, that they're reluctant to do it. Um, now, the, the treaties that he has reneged on, for instance, the Paris um, uh, Climate Accord, it doesn't go into effect till 2020. So by then, hopefully, we'll have someone else there who can re restore it. <laughs> now, the trade agreements um, were actually, that's being re the, the NAFTA agreement, which had many problems, has been renegotiated. Uh, there are elements of it that are an improvement, there are elements of it that shouldn't be in it at all. So that has to come through the legislative process again. I want to say thank you very much for co-sponsoring the bill HR 1044, which is Fairness for High Skilled Immigrants Act of 2019. And you are one of the initial co-sponsors for the bill this year. And thank you to your staffers in DC um, and uh, here as well. So where the bill stands right now is we have 240 bipartisan co-sponsors in Congress, and we're hoping we reach 290 by the end of March. And uh, with your and Congresswoman Lofgren's leadership, the request is to get this bill for a vote and also add it as a must-pass bill so a couple of anti-immigrant senators in the Senate don't stop 
the bill from passing. Okay, is there a question there? Um, the <laughs> okay. The request is to, the, uh, this is the fourth time I think this bill has entered Congress. The first time it passed with the majority, it was stopped in the Senate, and it was introduced a second time, it was introduced a third time, this is the fourth time, and so the request is to... Um, Make it happen, to right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So uh, we will do our best, but you know, you understand our democracy and the power that is vested in the Senate to put holds on bills by one person. Um, so that's, you know, and typically they put a hold on a bill because they want something. And then once they get it, then they, they lift the hold. So we'll just have to see how it plays out. Okay. Yes. Con Councilman, I started to call yeah. you Congressman. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie. And first, I want to thank you for helping the city of San Mateo when we approached the EPA and needed our funding for our new wastewater treatment plant. You came out in favor of that. We got the, the uh, okay on that. Thank you very much for that. But that is an infrastructure project. So that brings to my mind, coming from construction as I do, infrastructure as a larger national issue. We were told that there was going to be a huge infrastructure bill and jobs would be created, putting people back to work, good paying jobs doing what we really need. We have really, and infrastructure is big than a lot of people realize, bigger. It's huge. Do you know what's going on with that? Yes, I can give you a um, up-to-date uh, comment because I was flying home uh, on Thursday or Friday. I can never remember what day it is. I guess it was Thursday. And uh, Speaker Pelosi was on the flight. And she had just come from lunch with the president, which happens every year around St. Patrick's Day. We have this big Irish lunch and everyone dresses in green. And that's why you saw the president with a green tie and with, uh, um, with four leaf plovers or, uh, in his pocket. Uh, and they actually had a conversation uh, on policy. <laughs> <laughs> and he seems um, very inclined to be supportive of an infrastructure measure question is how much it's going to be and where we're going to get the funding for it. And on prescription drugs. Okay. So we may actually find a path forward to work on both those pieces of, of legislation. On the prescription drugs, you all realize that we have no negotiating power with the pharmaceutical companies in Medicare. And the result is that 25% you know, of people on Medicare don't take their drugs because they can't afford them. So uh, we could say it's anticipated about $11 billion a year in Medicare if we just had the ability to negotiate prices with the pharmaceutical companies. There are some drugs now that cost, hepatitis drug costs $1,000 a day, MS drugs cost over $300,000 a year, um, and some of these drugs, like insulin, that's been around forever, um, you've seen an increase in insulin and EpiPens that are 100% in just the last couple of years. And these are drugs that have been around. This is not an R&D issue that they're uh, responding to. So we really have to come to grips with this issue. Um, we've talked about it for a long time, and we haven't been able to deliver on it. So the fact that the president is willing um, to do something here, let's hope that uh, he doesn't have some pharmaceutical whisperer that is going to prevent him from doing the right thing. Okay, on this side, and then we'll take some more from, oh, you have some more, okay. Sarah? This is from the overflow room. Okay. As a formal, former intel analyst for the U.S. Army and a son on active duty in the Navy, my question is, how can we stop the furthering decline of our democracy? The president's statement on Breitbart News about his support for the police, military, and Trump bikers, but they don't play it tough until they go to a certain point, and then it would be very, very bad. Isn't this a serious sign of tyranny in this de democratic country? Uh, it's a very serious question, and I'm going to give a very serious answer. Yes. I have said on a number of times on national TV that our president is a national security risk. And I believe it. I absolutely believe it. And, and I, I, you know, I, I don't want to pause for that. I, I want us to think long and hard about what's happening here. He somehow, you know, he never took Civics 101. 
And so he somehow thinks that the attorney general is his attorney. He, he tells his attorney general, go tell the Southern District in New York to stop investigating me. It doesn't work that way. He thinks the military is his military because he's the commander in chief. It doesn't work this way. We are not an autocracy. And so his question is spot on. And our president doesn't realize how destructive he is, not just to our country, but our relationships with our allies all over the world. I was at the Munich Security Conference. I went to NATO last month. They are apoplectic. They're all thinking that, that maybe the U.S. is not our friend anymore and we've got to conceive a new organization. That would be so counterproductive and destructive to our safety and security. So, um, you know, we are the greatest nation in the world because we have had certain principles. And NATO and Article 5 is always that we will be there to defend you just like you're going to be there to defend us. And when 9-11 happened, that's what they did. And they are with us in Iraq and Afghanistan and Syria. That's how important having allies is against authoritarian countries like China and Russia. And, and let me make something really clear. Russia is a problem. <laughs> but let me tell you, China is a, a, a greater problem. How can I say it even more? If one's a hurricane, the other is a tornado. I mean, they are both doing very significant things to undermine our country. And they do it every day. The fact that China was able to hack into 27 universities just last week and get the R&D on maritime projects for DOD that were underway in those various universities is a cyber war act. It is an act of cyber warfare. What did our president say or do? OK, next question. Apparently, new NAFTA has an add-on medical caveat of carte blanche to big pharma in US, Canada, and Mexico. Is there a way to stop this? Yes, you don't vote for it. Um, that was the, what I was referencing earlier. You know, unrelated, they um, put this one provision in for uh, big pharma that would be um, you know, absolutely countervailing to everything we want to do in terms of bringing down the cost of pharmaceuticals. So uh, that will not stay in the uh, agreement if the president wants to have it pass the House. Yes, I was just wondering how we can stop him from acting unilaterally. Okay, the question is, how can we stop him from acting unilaterally? Well, when he had the majorities in both the House and the Senate, uh, he basically had a blank check to do what he wanted. He doesn't have that blank check anymore, and he's beginning to realize it. Um, regardless of what you thought about Nancy Pelosi before, I think you can recognize today how lucky we are that she is the Speaker of the House. <laughs> I'll tell you a cute little story. We were in uh, Brussels at, at NATO, and we were in this little tiny restaurant having dinner, and we came down the stairs, and all of the workers, the servers and the chefs in the restaurant, came up to her and thanked her for um, protecting our country and um, the NATO countries as well. So um, it, it shows you that people are watching. Over here? This is a less talkative group over here. What's <laughs> Um, I wanted to thank you for having all of these town halls. We, uh, as your constituents, greatly appreciate it. Now, my question has to do with the oversight process, um, which, n as you say, now that uh, it's at least the House is independent, it's functioning better. But the problem, as I perceive it, is too many members of the executive branch are not fulfilling their um, obligations by regulation and by law. They're foot dragging, they're refusing to comply, they're refusing to provide records until 
it seems they end up having to be sued either through FOIA or you know whatever. It, it's essentially a matter of justice delayed equals justice denied. They can continue to engage in inappropriate behavior perhaps or un, uh, unobserved behavior uh, for too long. What can be done, if anything, to encourage the members of the executive branch, many of whom are political appointees, to more appropriately follow the rules under which they're supposed to be working? Right. So, uh, good question. Somewhat limited in what we can do, but that's what oversight is so important. You can call Wilbur Ross to the oversight committee and drill him on the fact that he violated uh, the uh, Administrative Procedures Act in putting that question on the census. And he lied to Congress in, in doing so. Um, we put enough heat on the former EPA administrator, the former director of um, Secretary of Interior, that the President had to let them go. So shining a spotlight on their errant behavior often is very effective. And now the only problem is we keep getting, you know, <laughs> bigger nightmares. Um, you know, and, and that, you know, when you think about it, this is not normal and it should not become the new normal. We have, we have wolves guarding the hen house now. I mean, I had the EPA administrator out here to look at the Cargill salt ponds. Um, it was, uh, by the way, I want to know I sacrificed. It was Super Bowl Sunday and I left the game <laughs> and met him to go look at the salt ponds. Uh, my, my point to him was that uh, this is never going to be developed on. The city of Redwood City was with me and the city council members were there. It's um, already permitted for salt ponds and if you change the designation about being navigable waters, uh, all you're going to do is increase the value of the property, which makes it more expensive if we want to retain it as wetlands at some point in time in the future. Of course, he totally ignored me and then reversed what was a 200-page document um, that had been finished in 2016 at the end of the Obama administration and just ignored it. So because of the speech and debate clause in Congress, you can do anything on the floor of the House. Uh, <laughs> I actually made a statement last week and presented that document so it's in the public domain. And you can see it on my website if you like. Hi. What are your thoughts on SB 50? I know that it was um, pulled from, the resolution was pulled from the supervisors meeting earlier this week, so I just wanted to hear what you thought about. Uh, it's the Scott Wiener bill on, I'm trans it's oh, the it's Senator Wiener bill on transportation. Oh, okay, housing. so that's, a, that's not a, a federal issue, that's a state issue. Um, so I don't really weigh in on state issues. Um, my sense is that it's probably not ready for prime time yet and there are cities and counties uh, around the state that would like to weigh in before um, he moves the bill and would like to see some amendments. So uh, I, that's my, my guess, but it's a, a state bill. So from the, other, uh, from the overflow room, this is a person who has an adult disabled child with autism and is concerned about the proposed cuts to Medicaid that the Trump administration is proposing through block granting and wants to know what can be done, actually what that person and others in similar circumstances could do to prevent the Medicaid cuts. Okay, part of my job is to lower your blood pressure. <laughs> so um, the president's budget that was submitted that has these draconian cuts is his fantasy. It's not going to happen. So recognize that and realize that that, and it's for any president. They, it's their kind of pie in the sky, this is what I want, but it still has to go through the legislative process. We hold the purse strings. So um, he thinks he's gonna build a $50 billion wall, ain't gonna happen. <laughs> Over here. Uh, there is a um, narrative on the other side that the Congressional Democrats are irrationally committed to fighting the President to such an extent that they've given up any commitment to border security and they're reversing their, their earlier positions on that. What, what's the response to okay, that? Okay, good question. Thank you for asking it. 
I want border security, you want border security. We want the rules in this country to be followed. We want people who stand in line and wait for their turn to come to this country to have priority. Now, uh, the wall is not going to prevent drugs from coming into this country. Most of the drugs, I think it's some high percentage, 80, 90 percent of the drugs come through our ports of entry. And there's a series of ports of entry along our border. They also, interesting to note, come from China. Fentanyl co doesn't come as much from Mexico. It comes from China. And guess how it gets here? Shipping <laughs> comes in through shipping containers. Or it comes in through Canada, where we have no border. You can just walk across, right? So there are things we absolutely need to do. We need more personnel on our borders, at our ports of entry. We have, there's hundreds of thousands of people that go back and forth across the border every day for, for employment purposes. Um, so there's this fear of holding um, commerce. So we need more of the scanners, and then we need a whole lot more dogs, because you know in the end, the best way to detect drugs are dogs. Uh, so uh, we need to put more personnel, we need to have more scanners, we need more dogs, we need more immigration judges because there's now a backlog of 800,000 cases um, so that they can pursue them in a timely fashion. Um, we need to spend more time looking at how we can help these countries where people are fleeing to make sure that they don't have, feel compelled to come to the United States. So there's lots of things we need to do. This idea of putting up a wall uh, is a very costly enterprise without the requisite benefits. Um, you know, they say if you, no matter how high you make a wall, someone is going to find a way to get over it or under it. And we know that there are lots of tunneling. Now, what we can do, and what we have done effectively, have used blimps. They're called aerostats. They were left over in the military, so Border Patrol took them. And they are able to have, by radar, able to uh, span, I don't know, some two or 300 miles. And last year, the eight blimps were responsible for uh, apprehending over 60 tons of drugs, because a lot of these drugs come in by small aircraft that are, cannot be detected. So, you know, they've got all these schemes that we have got to somehow overcome, but the wall is not the answer. So, we are spending a lot more money on border protection and augmenting the, those who serve at the border. So, I would be one of those to say, yes, we need more dollars for uh, border security, um, but there are smart ways of spending that money, and there are dumb ways to spend that money. Yes? Um, I have a follow-on to that. Um, when it came out about the family separations at the border, you went down I with the delegation and made an impassioned plea for, for it to end, but we've seen um, in the news and elsewhere credible reports that it continues, that there's a proliferation of detention centers, and that people are being abused and held in awful conditions. So what is happening now to, to stop that? Okay. Um, yes, last June when we started hearing that they were uh, separating parents and children at the border, I decided I'm going down. And before I knew it, there were 24 other members of Congress that joined me um, to make that trip. What's most interesting about that trip, um, and it shows the, the greatness of the community that we live in, I happened to be at an event with um, a number of um, individuals who were very upset about the separation. I said, well, you know, you can just come down and protest. They got on their cell phones and made reservations to go down at the same time. They then went, put emails out to the community. They got 18 duffel bags full of clothing. They got over 50 boxes from Amazon and over $5,000 in gift cards to take down to Catholic Charities in McAllen, Texas. Um, they didn't stop there. They've made three trips down since then. Um, so uh, to answer your question about the separation, it's not happening now. Uh, 
the good news is this week the administration has decided that they're going to allow these families to go to their sponsors because all these people who come here have sponsors, someone here in the United States that they can um, live with. So they're now going to allow that to happen and with ankle bracelets so you can um, keep track of them while they wait for their asylum hearing. The law is the law of this country, that if you are seeking asylum, you have the right to enter this country and then have a credible threat hearing, which happens rather quickly, and then um, as soon as can happen after that, a hearing to determine whether or not you are uh, eligible to have asylum in our country. Now, most people don't get asylum. About 80 percent don't get asylum. So that's why that process needs to move much quicker. But in the end, are we then going to turn around and send these people back into these environments that are dangerous? That's why we've got to help those countries restore security there. Yes? On that subject, uh, whatever role you have, uh, I wish you would give, con I wish the representatives would give consideration to quality of life of pe for people here in California. I mean, it's, I mean, off the homeless in San Jose, San Francisco, Oakland, LA, Sacramento, and trying to get from point A to point B is impossible. I'm, it's, uh, I wish you would give that some serious consideration. Okay, so uh, that is a regional issue that needs to be addressed with all the great talent. Many of these city council members who are here um, work together to try and come up with solutions around transportation. Uh, we're also trying to build more housing so that we can get people off the streets. I mean, the situation in San Francisco is, is really quite interesting. Um, I've visited some of the navigation centers. If you provide wraparound services to people who are homeless, they stay housed. The solution is providing those resources and getting them into adequate housing, which frankly is cheaper than having them on the streets and having them um, come into the emergency rooms. Uh, in San Francisco, they estimate that those who, s who are on the streets cost about $60,000 a year to the taxpayers of the city. If you get them into housing with wraparound services, it's about $30,000 a year. Um, from the overflow room, they're asking, um, Two groups at Department of Homeland Security that ensured electoral sec uh, security have been devastated. What will you do to protect our electoral integrity at the national level? So uh, it, it's an issue that I spent a lot of time on, both on the Intelligence Committee um, and in discussions with people locally who know a lot about it. Uh, we need to return to paper ballots. We need to return to paper ballots with um, scanning and then mandatory audits because the systems that exist today are basically systems that have been created over the last 10 or 20 years. Um, there's four companies that produce almost all of the voting machines in this country. Um, the contracts that local jurisdictions have to sign do not allow them to do what's called red teaming which means you can't try and hack into the machine to see if there's any foibles. Um, there's a group called DEF CON. They're hackers that like to kind of show their craft. Um, they had, I don't know, 10 machines at their convention in Las Vegas last year or earlier this year, and they were able to hack into all 10 of those machines. So they're trying to draw attention to the fact that we've got a problem. Um, and they say in some cases they have detected uh, software glitches and bugs dating back to 2008 that the companies have not put patches in to fix. So the question is, we know that the Russians got into voting records. Question is, did they get into voting machines? And talking to the professional hackers, they tell me there's no way we can tell whether or not they got into the voting machines because there aren't any fingerprints that are left. 
there's no way that there's a means by which you can detect that. So um, whether that's true or not, I don't want to find out at this point. I want to make sure that our voting system is secure, and that's why all the experts now say that's the way we have to do it. Yes. Uh, in reference to the uh, shutdown of 35 days, uh, I was wondering, most federal employees now are, have to be in TSP. And so I was wondering if you could um, make it possible so that when they have a shutdown, that their pay gets automatically withdrawn from TSP, and then when the, recon you know, the, the made whole happens, get put in. I was talking to a TSP person, and they said their, their uh, uh, request for loans went way up during this thing, but if it could be made automatic, because they, you know, the, the employee has to, and the government gives the five percent anyway, so it's their money; it's already there. And if they can, great have idea. Seamless trans great idea. TSP is Thrift Savings Plan. Um, many federal employees contribute to it, and you know, have um, a fair nest egg. So uh, it would be excellent suggestion. I will look into it. Thank you. I think many of us in the room are quite frustrated with the way politics in Washington is so partisan and so dysfunctional. But I wanted to thank you um, so much for supporting H.R. 763, which is a bipartisan market-based um, bill to lower greenhouse gas emissions. And um, my question is, you know, climate change doesn't affect only Republicans or only Democrats. It's a, it's a universal thing. We're going to have fires. We're going to have heat, heat, um, heat waves. We're going to have drought. We're going to so have sea level rise. We're going to have sea level rise, exactly. So is there any way that we can convince more Republicans to get on board with this train that's basically already left the station? We know the public agrees that this is a problem. You want an honest answer? <laughs> no. There's, there's no hope this year. Um, but just like we saw the Parkland students able to go to Tallahassee in Florida and in three weeks get three laws passed in a very conservative state that's very pro-NRA. Um, I believe the kids are going to be able to turn this around. I, I'm glad that they played hooky from school yesterday. Um, so um, I actually think that the Green New Deal is something that we must embrace. Some people say, oh, how can you possibly do this? You know, it's aspirational, no question, but we've got to get very serious about the fact that this planet is burning up. And the only way we do it is by creating the equivalent of a Manhattan Project, where we're going to put lots of resources, our allies are going to put lots of resources, our enemies are going to put lots of resources into um, addressing this. The, re the reluctance to move away from carbon has got to end. And we've got to do carbon capture. We've got to do carbon uh, fees. We've got to rehabilitate all of our buildings and make them more energy efficient. We've got to move away from uh, fuel-driven cars and into electric cars. Um, we've got to move away from cars. <laughs> um, you know, there's, there's so much. But, it is that dire. And to see 99% of the, the uh, scientists saying, yes, this is happening, this is real, and having a president say, no, it's not, and a, a, a fearful Republican Congress that doesn't want, you know, it, it, it's, it comes down to something so basic. They want to get reelected. And frankly, they care more about getting reelected than uh, protecting their country. The, the people like Jeff Flake, who I served with in the House, I mean, those are the giants. John McCain, those are the people that, but look, you know, look what happens to them. Those who are moderate lose election or retire. Okay, yes. Um, many people, including myself, have had some concerns about the Electoral College uh, procedures. And uh, I know that there's been talk about making some changes on the state level and everything else, but do you have any comments on what can be done about that? 
Okay, you all understand that the Electoral College favors um, smaller states, right? Um, there's a great book by a woman named Joan Williams. She, we actually had her at one of our town halls last year. She wrote a book, White Working Class. And one of my takeaways from that book was the fact that um, we are destined now to have more elections where the popular vote is trumped, excuse me for using that word, <laughs> uh, <coughs> trumped by the Electoral College. So it's happened twice now in uh, 16 years. It's going to happen more and more because of this system that we have. So the more states that will basically um, pass a law that says that their state in the Electoral College will vote according to the popular vote um, will be um, you know, very compelling. There's not enough of them yet. California is one of them, I believe. Um, and then, you know, to change the Electoral College will take a constitutional amendment. And you'll, we'll never see those smaller states that um, tend to be redder uh, uh, participate in that. So it, it's, um, it's a problem. It's a real problem. And it, to just put it in perspective, it takes 11 other states to equal the population of California. So you have 22 U.S. Senators compared to two U.S. Senators based on population. We thank our founding fathers. Okay, so <laughs> thank you all for coming. It's really a pleasure to be with you.